This is a story of old New York. It's about two brothers, Homer and Langley, the Collier brothers, who lived in a big old brownstone in Harlem. They grew up there, and when their parents died, they kept it going. Homer and Langley were always what you might call a little reclusive, a little eccentric. They'd gone to fancy schools and had prestigious degrees, but they never really earned a living, so to speak. Homer worked as a lawyer for a few years, but kept flaking. Langley had a degree in engineering and played piano, but he never got a paycheck. A lot of people thought they were rich, but anything they had was mostly on account of never spending a dime and never ever throwing anything away. Harlem used to be a place for the rich. For New Yorkers, it was considered out in the country, if you can imagine that. As the brothers got older, the neighborhood changed. The rich people moved on and their big houses were split up into little apartments for the working poor, mainly African-Americans. Langley took to wandering the streets late at night, dressed in ragged clothes. He'd walk for miles all over the city looking for anything interesting and he'd drag it back home. Homer, on the other hand, rarely left the house. His health had taken a turn and he'd lost his eyesight. He relied completely on his brother for everything. Their general distrust of humanity extended to doctors, so Homer never saw one about his eyes. Langley concocted a treatment using a hundred oranges a week and peanut butter. So they lived this strange shut-in life for quite some time. People in the neighborhood called them the ghosty men, but they were known to be polite. And Langley had a few admirers amongst the people living in the shoebox apartment surrounding their old brownstone. They said he was soft-spoken and cultured, and I'm sure he was. One day in 1938, this reporter showed up. She was bored writing for the society pages and wanted a story with some meat. She'd heard about these crazy brothers and staked out their house, hoping to interview them. Around midnight, Langley came out for his evening ramble and she got hold of him for a chat. Polite as ever, he told her a little about his life and about his brother and figured that was that. Well, it wasn't. The story was a hit. Today, you'd say it went viral. Everyone was fascinated by these old brothers in Harlem. Reporters started showing up trying to catch a glimpse. The lady reporter kept writing follow-ups, and soon Langley and Homer were the last thing they'd ever want to be. Celebrities. Wild rumors spread about them that they'd filled their house with dead bodies or they had mattresses stuffed with cash. Then the city got involved. They sent taxmen and meter readers and cops. See, when you keep to yourself, the city wants to know why. And there were break-ins. Local kids with dreams of buried treasure kept trying to break into their house and when they couldn't do that, they started breaking windows. Through all this, Langley never let anyone inside, not the cops, not the reporters, not the burglars. He would tell them, the house is too upset. You see, what nobody knew was that for years, Langley had been collecting things from the streets of New York and piling it all inside the house. A lot of things. Inside the house, things had gotten weird. When the break-in started, he built booby traps to catch the thieves. He had training in engineering, so they were quite elaborate, with trip wires connected to deadfalls and so forth. He boarded up windows and nailed doors shut. The junk inside got so thick he had to dig tunnels to get around. They'd stopped using electricity and gas years ago, so inside it was dark all day. By kerosene lamp, Langley would read to his blind brother where they'd listen to music on a crystal radio, which doesn't need electricity. Langley painted cityscapes all in red, visions his blind brother would describe to him. So for ten years or so, the public couldn't get enough about these old brothers who just wanted to be left alone. 
Then one day the cops get a tip. There's a dead body at the Collier house. This isn't the first time they heard this kind of thing. They figure they'll show up. Langley will stick his head out the window and tell them to go away. But this time it's different. Nobody answers when they bang on the drain pipe, so they try the door, but still nothing. Finally, they get some hatchets and split the door open, and what they see inside is crazy. It's so much worse than anyone can imagine. It takes hours of hacking away just to make it a few feet into the house. Walls of newspaper are piled up to the ceiling. It's black as night inside. The fire department arrives and sends up a ladder to the second story. Inside they find Homer, sitting on the floor, his chin resting on his knees, and dead in his bathrobe. They load him out the window in a sack. But where was Langley? For the next 14 days, city workers and cops dug through the house. Every day, a big crowd gathered outside to watch the drama. They found 14 pianos, a Model T Ford in pieces, a canoe, 25,000 books, 3,000 records, mountains of newspaper going back 40 years an x-ray machine, medical specimens in jars, a horse-drawn carriage and the jawbone of a horse, paintings, guns, swords, a rusted-out baby carriage, boxes and boxes and bags and bags. More than a hundred tons of junk they dragged out of the house. All the while the police were looking for Langley and the newspapers were going crazy. They speculated that he murdered his brother and ran off. His photo is wired around the country and the FBI gets involved. He's spotted all over town, but the tips never pan out. A little over two weeks after they found Homer, workmen move a huge bale of junk and they find Langley, or his body. He lay no more than 10 feet from where they found Homer, but hidden away inside one of his tunnels. Turns out he died first, crushed to death by one of his own booby traps. On his way to feed Homer, he must have tripped it and become trapped under a mountain of rubbish. Homer, who relied on his brother for everything, simply starved to death. Afterwards, they sold off what they could, tore down the house, and some distant relatives squabbled about the small inheritance. That's the end of the story. It was always going to be a tragic end for those brothers who'd gone so far off the map and into their own world. It's funny that they became legends just for wanting to be left alone. That and a house filled to the brim with a hundred tons of weird garbage.